Check. Welcome everybody to the Tune Show, the MC Tune Show, MC Tune Live. I am your host, MC Tune, on this good Tunes Day night. Uh, tonight I have a, a a little different, little different one. I have uh, Will Duffy with me, who debated Witsit and Jaren a week ago, and we're going to be reviewing the debate. So welcome, Will. Thanks, Mike. Uh, glad to be here. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I, people probably don't know who you are unless they watched. So uh, you want to introduce yourself a little bit, and uh, then we can start looking at some of the stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my name is Will Duffy. I'm a uh, pastor out in Colorado. I actually am traveling right now, though, on uh, vacation, and so my video quality and audio quality are not going to be great. But I'm hoping the uh, content will make up for it. All right. And uh, so Will has a bunch of um, selections from, from the debate that, that we're going to go over. Um, but now you also have said, and I, I don't, I don't know the back, background of this. You've said that you, most of your uh, career, or a lot of your career is in finance. Um, can you explain what that is? Cause I don't know what that um, means. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I spent the majority of my career in finance, uh, helping people with investing and taxes and estate planning and all all those different kinds of things. And uh, recently made a switch to going full time in the ministry. Okay, so that's where I'm at now. All right. And and so, <laughs> a little bit of a different uh, background to this side of the debate because um now I, i'm not but a lot of the people that do what what i do what you do are agnostic and atheists and so you're you're a pastor you're the, the opposite side of the of the um the spectrum on that but uh yet you still think the earth is a globe amazing yeah it is uh i, I do think christianity and specifically certain christians are mainly responsible for kind of keeping this whole flat earth ideology alive. And it was that realization for me that made me want to kind of do my part in uh, making an attempt to kind of nip it in the bud, so to speak, before it gets any bigger. All right. Well, so, so then how was it that you came to be on uh, with Jaron and, and uh, Austin? Yeah, so kind of long story short, about two and a half years ago, a friend of mine was posting on Facebook about Flat Earth, and I didn't think it was possible that she was being serious, and so I engaged her and found out she was being serious, she was really Flat Earth, and uh, she started sending me links to videos and introducing me to some of the main characters in the space, like Flat Earth Dave. And uh, I, it just kind of took off from there. I watched the videos, I asked questions, I presented arguments. And when I realized that the Flat Earth movement is actually growing and predominantly in the church, that's when I decided I wanted, wanted to kind of do something more than just interacting with a friend of mine. And so I put out a, a handful of videos on YouTube against the position. Uh, those quickly kind of dis dispersed and made their way throughout the Flat Earth community. Next thing I knew, I had an email from Dave Weiss, Flat Earth Dave, wanting to, you know, discuss these things with me. And when I finally got around to scheduling with him, he said he was on vacation and, and Austin was going to step in in his place. So that's how that whole thing came about. Dave does that a lot. He likes to uh, to let let Austin... It's probably wise for Dave to do that because he's terrible. <laughs> he, he's terrible at debating. So Flat Earth Dave, he goes on podcasts all the time where the other people have zero background. They don't know any history of Flat Earth at all. 
So he can just talk and talk and they're, they're just like, I don't know. So, um, okay. So do you have, uh, do you have some clips that you want to, you want to show yeah. you can share your screen and I'll just present your screen. Okay, great. Yeah. I, uh, th this debate, in my opinion, it really wasn't a debate. It was more of just kind of a relaxed discussion, which I prefer, but, but I do, I do not think it went very well for their side. And, uh, as I was going through trying to prepare clips for us tonight, there, there's, there's going to be too many for us to cover, but I yeah. think we'll hit some of the highlights and people will get a flavor of how things went. And if they want, they can go watch the four hour video on YouTube. So this first one here that I'm going to share, uh, has to do with the shape of Australia. And so let me go ahead and share my screen. This, this got him a little nervous. I liked this, this line here. Okay, here we go. Okay. So anyway, you guys, this is what us globe people believe Australia looks like. And I, and I had to cut this out of Google Maps, but Google Maps has a scale. And then here is what uh, the flat earth map says Australia looks like. So right off the bat, just from a simple logic standpoint, we should know that both of these cannot be right. They're drastically different. Yeah. Agreed? Yeah, they're just a concept. Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, sure, that's what they are. All right, so, so, so just for the audience who's never seen this before, uh, I want you to take a look at the drastic difference that the globe people believe is the shape of Australia and the flat earth people believe is the shape of Australia. Flat earth maps ma make it Australia into a hot dog. All right. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was a good place to start in the debate. I think most of us are familiar with the shape of Australia uh, since we were children. And uh, when I was looking at a flat earth map, the first time I saw one, I was like, wait a minute, what, what country is that? I couldn't even recognize it. And then I found out it was Australia. And uh, obviously I understand why it's so deformed on the flat earth map, which is because they're using a projection of the globe where uh, sizes and shapes are completely messed up as you get further to the outside away from the North Pole on their map. Uh, and so I wanted to just kind of throw this out there and see what they said. And uh, th they do not want to admit that this image here on the left uh, is the proper shape <laughs> of Australia uh, for obvious reasons, because then that would kind of falsify their map and uh, would also give, you know, credence here to the globe side. And so I specifically asked... Uh, Austin here, which one of these is right? And you can hear his answer right now. So my question for you, Austin, is which one of these do you think best represents the actual size of Australia? Uh, great question, man. I, I don't know. Like, I, I would say maybe somewhere in the middle. What about that? Because my, my answer remains the same here. This is just a concept, the construct. We weren't even allowed to make but one type of map. We can't even freely and privately explore the earth. Okay. So his response is he doesn't know, um, which I think is very sad. I, I think we all know the shape of Australia. Uh, what's interesting to me is he said that we can't know because we're not allowed to freely and privately explore. What he's talking about there is actually Antarctica. Yeah, he got confused about that. It just yeah. because it, it's it's an area that starts with the letter A, maybe it was his confusion. Yeah, so that was a little bit of a, of an obfuscation there because there's no Australia treaty like they like to talk about the Antarctica treaty. And I'm also not even talking about the entire Earth. I'm just talking about one simple landmass, which again is big, but it's not that big compared to other continents. Yeah. And so I think this is significant. Uh, which is that they, they're unwilling to say that this here is what Australia looks like. And so then I presented uh, what I believe was evidence that the globe shape of Australia is correct and that theirs is not, which I'm going to go ahead and play now. 
and this has to do with flights. Uh, oh, they, they got so nervous. <laughs> yeah, plane flights. Let's it go ahead and watch this. Beautiful. Real quick. Cool. So back to Australia. So th the one the one here on the left is the shape of Australia on the globe. The one on the right is the shape of Australia on every flat Earth map I've ever seen, including the Gleason map. And so, Austin, I'm going to show you right now what I think is proof that the one on the left is right and that the flat earth map is wrong. Okay? Okay, cool. All right, cool. So we could easily figure this out. The easiest way, which we, you and I can't do, is we could just go to Australia and drive it. We could just drive across and see how long it is, but we can't. But you know what we could do? We could do something close to that, which is fly, fly over Australia. So I'm going to show you here. Here is a flight uh, from Perth to Brisbane. And if we look at what we believe, what, what the globe people believe is the shape of Australia, we, we should know that the width is just slightly wider than the max height from top to bottom. And so this flight right here was four hours and three minutes from Perth to Brisbane. And then here's a flight. Okay. Here's a flight from Melbourne to Darwin. And it's three hours and 55 minutes. And that's that's from almost the northernmost point to the southernmost point. So we just went far west to far east, far north to far south. And what do you know? The distance of the flight is almost identical. It's only eight minutes. That's so literally how that that program gets the speed. It's assuming hold, the distance. Hold on. They... So, sorry, so, sorry. This is important. Uh, so going north to south and east to west on Australia, which our map would say should be about the same, but east to west is slightly longer, it's an eight-minute flight difference. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, flights are consistently different times. There is no like specific exact time for flights. And the way that these programs get the supposed speeds that the planes go is they I'm assume the distance and then they look at the time. You're saying that, oh, it's not always eight minutes. I, I could literally just Google it right now and I'll find one that is not the same time as these. Okay, so he went to his normal talking point on flights, which is ground speed versus airspeed, which has absolutely nothing to do with this. Yeah. The, uh, the red circles here are circling the actual flight time. The actual flight time is not measured by anything other than the time they departed and the time they landed. So, yeah, and he's like, and that program, blah, blah, speed. No, time. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's fascinating because if, if you remember the shape of Australia on their map, it is like two and a half to three times wider than it is tall. And so these flights would make no sense. So I thought this was pretty significant. And I didn't have time to do this, but... Um, we also have pictures of Australia from space. <laughs> and I know they don't like the oh, pictures. Yeah, they, they'll just say it's fake, of course. <laughs> yeah, but the pictures um, from space also tell us what the shape of Australia is. And that, again, of course, lines up with what we're looking at here. I'm going to pull up. A picture real quick that i wanted to show during the discussion but i didn't have the opportunity they, to they tried hard to to prevent you from showing stuff yeah that they okay. realized that they had agreed to let you show stuff but they really tried not to uh i just want to make sure that you're seeing this new picture I, now i am yeah i see six uh pictures there what flat earthers don't realize because they don't look into this is they think that there's th that that these Apollo missions took one picture of Earth. Yeah. So if you if you talk about the 1972 blue marble picture, they think that's the only picture. What they don't from realize all the missions from all the missions, they think there's one. Right. Yeah. What they don't realize is that they actually took hundreds from each mission. And so these six here. I pulled out of 156 pictures of Earth that the Apollo 8 mission took. Now, the Apollo 8 mission was the first mission to go past the low Earth orbit, and their main purpose of that mission was actually the moon. The main purpose of it was to photograph the moon to figure out where they were going to land. 
And so they still took pictures of Earth. And this is just six of them out of the 156. And we can see uh, right here is Australia. And we can see Australia right here. And the reason I point this out to flat earthers is because they think there's just one and they suggest that NASA painted it on like a black wall and took a picture of it and claimed that was the picture that they took. But there's hundreds of them. They're all different. They, the, the part that's lit up from the sun is different. The clouds are different. The part of the globe is completely different. And so it, it would are... have to be hundreds and hundreds of paintings, all different. Yeah, and, yeah, appro approaching thousands. And and did they produce the name of the person that did this? Did they produce the place that this was done? Did they produce any supporting evidence for it? Of course not. Yeah, I, I call it baseless claims. Yeah. Flat earthers love to make baseless claims. They just make things up without any evidence. Well, and they, Wits, Wits, it, for them. Wits it has something to say about that. The person making a positive claim has the burden of proof. He for always forgets, though. Yeah, they, they, they make a lot of positive claims. All right, let's go to the let's go to the next section. So I, I always like to point out to flat earthers that we do not have a real flat earth map. And yeah, I, I know they don't like to keep hearing that, but I think we need to keep talking about it. Well, yeah. And, and of course, they will always say this. We don't have a model. And then talk about their model. That's right. All right, so here's a quick clip here of me just asking them about the fact that they do not have a real map. Okay, so here's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, I have never found a map where the scale was wrong. And all of those maps are based on the globe model. And so my question for you, Austin, before we actually take a closer look at the quote-unquote flat earth map, is why is there not a flat earth map with a scale? How could we fully map out the earth if we can't even fully traverse south? Okay, so here we go again uh, with the Antarctica stuff. Make a whole what map of afraid. everything except Antarctica, which you can explore, but you can still make a map of all of that. Exactly. Yeah. So I, again, I, I think he's just trying to derail it here. So like, for example, let's just pick a landmass like Australia, right? They can't give us a map of Australia with a scale, with distances, with the proper shape, but we already have that. None of the distances are wrong. And so this appeal to, to Antarctica thing, because he claims you can't freely and privately explore it, doesn't, it's just obfuscation on yeah. the point at hand. And by the way, uh, I didn't have a chance to ask this of Austin, but I can't freely and privately explore his house. And so I don't think that's evidence that his house doesn't exist. You, but of course, it's a lie. You can freely and privately explore Antarctica. It's the second article of the treaty. And they'll say, well, it's expensive. You didn't say free as in it's going to be paid for by somebody else. You you said free as in nobody's going to stop you from going where you want, which you can do. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of their uh, one of their main talking points, yeah. and uh, hopefully we'll end that soon. Now I do want to deal with something. So they brought up an argument I had not heard of, and they asked me my thoughts on it, and I was pretty honest that I hadn't heard of it and I told them I would look into it and so I did. So I want to play this quick clip here about the Kanagu Mountain and then I would like to respond to it. All right. All right. So these are the this is the Kanagu Peak which is about 9000 feet high and you're standing about 1000 feet from where you're at. This is supposed to be several thousand feet behind the curve. Now, what your your model believes is that things are lifted up into the sky for us and displayed way higher than they should be. Every time you see the sunset actually the sun's already set. Every time you see the sun rise, it's uh, actually further below the earth than you, you see it. They just tell us that things are magically looming up. Here's a better picture right here. Watch this. Now, any other time of year, let me get a little better one. This one right after it's better. Okay, so here, any time of year, you would just look out there and you would see nothing. People would tell you that this horizon is the edge of the earth. But on this particular day, twice a year, 
every year, the sun sets behind it, and all of a sudden we see Kanagu is there. So it doesn't waver. It doesn't rise and, and set. It doesn't sometimes be seen and sometimes not. It's always there. So you're, you and have like, to... Like, I have another video where it shows it a little bit longer. Uh, this may play a sound, though. And I mean, we can share it because ahead, share I, it. I'm I'll trying to it. figure out what a logical explanation is for this because there isn't one. Okay. So no logical explanation for the Kanagu Mountain. Um, there is. And well, it didn't the, take me the, the first thing that's got no logical explanation is the fact that the sun is being obstructed by the horizon. They will never talk about that. But let's let <laughs> ignore that for now. <laughs> Go ahead, Will. Yes. So first of all, I let me see if I can rewind shortly here. Okay. First of all, I am not good at thinking on my feet, unfortunately. Uh, but had I been thinking quickly when they were bringing this up to me for the first time, I, I should have pointed out the size of the sun in this video. And here's why. The size of the sun here is very large. It's practically the same size as it is when it's up above us in the sky. Yeah. That doesn't work on a flat earth. In the flat earth model, and they, they show videos of this, the sun disappears from sight because it gets too far away, yeah. right? They don't believe it's actually going down below the horizon. And so the fact that this sun is this big and being obstructed by the horizon literally doesn't work on a flat earth model. So that's the first thing. Uh, so I wish I would have brought that up. Now, by the way, had I brought that up, they would have probably talked about something like atmospheric magnification. Yes. And so it's fascinating to me that had I brought this up, they would have brought up a response of an optical illusion where the atmosphere changes how things are viewed, which they rejected when we talked about eclipses. And so this whole thing uh, is funny because they will use the atmosphere and optical illusions that, that the atmosphere causes when it suits them, and then they will forget about them and ignore them when it won't. Um, I also went onto YouTube to actually find this video to rewatch it. And I do feel bad for flat earthers for one thing, which is that YouTube is clearly censoring them. So yeah. when I search, when I search for Jaronism and the Kanagu mountain, I don't get anything by Jaronism or any, anything from any flat earthers. So I actually found another video, uh, which I will show a screenshot of right now, right here, uh, which was helpful to me. So it's right here. <laughs> this guy, I don't even know who he is, Sly Sparkane. Oh, Sly, uh, did, Sly did... is better out forever. He's awesome. Okay, cool. I'm glad yeah. you know who he is. He, he was very helpful here. So he pointed out that these pictures, so you should recognize the one in the background. That's the same one that, that Jaron showed me and that yep. they asked me about. He actually takes the, a picture of the actual mountain and shows that what, what you can see on the sun is literally just the tip of the top of the mountain. This, the, the, this mountain, I believe, is in France. It's over 9,000 feet tall. Yeah. And all you're seeing above the horizon with the sun behind it is maybe a thousand feet. So the majority of the mountain is missing. Where is it? It's, it's behind the curve. Yeah. So the, yeah, their only yeah. thing is the, the amount of curve that they predicted for the globe isn't the amount of curve that they saw. And so the, the the error isn't that the globe doesn't work. The error is that they did the wrong globe. Yeah. Um, by the way, th these these pictures of this uh, sunset with the mountain silhouette are being taken of a, at about a thousand feet uh, high. Yeah. Um, and and then the mountain is nine thousand feet high. And so when when we start to in both these formulas of curve and how much we should be able to see, you have to make sure you're factoring in so many things, including observer height, including the height of the of the object you're looking at. They, they typically, et cetera. They typically use the same calculator. 
the Earth Curve Calculator, which does have observer height in it, but specifically makes it clear that it assumes that light travels in a straight path. Right, right at the top, it says it's not taking into account refraction. So they they almost never take into account refraction, which is not the globe. In the globe, we have air. So, you know, it's uh, unless we have not air day, uh, we're going to have to include refraction. And of course, Witsit, Witsit says the same thing. Refraction always happens. That's why it's important. You can't ignore refraction according to Witsit himself. Yet, he ignores refraction when it suits him. Yeah, and I'm going to share a quick website real quick you're probably familiar with in case people are not following what I'm saying here. This is going to be just a very rudimentary drawing of what's happening with the Kanagoo Mountain. So this is a website called flatearth.ws. They've got great information. Super good uh, website, yep. And so if you look here, so... The, the picture is being taken a thousand feet above the surface of the earth. That's the elevation. And then this mountain, which is beyond the curve, is 9,000 feet. And so the reason you can see the tip of it uh, behind or in front of the sun and get the silhouette is because of these heights. And that is the reason that we don't see all 9,000 feet of it. So I'd like to take this Kanagu Mountain and put it back on to the flat earthers and have them explain if the earth is flat, why we don't see all 9,000 feet. We just kind of see the top peaks. And of course their answer is, as you you already said, all sorts of optical claims. Um, The difference is they don't have any empirical evidence supporting these types of optical uh, effects that they say happen. Right. Cool. Let's uh, let's move on to lunar eclipses really quick. Uh, this one's pretty significant, so let's work our way through it. Here's the first clip. All right, lunar okay. eclipses. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. So what is a lunar eclipse on the flat Earth model? Good question. I don't so know. That, Fail! Is that- I, I can tell you a few possibilities. Okay. All right, so something I noticed throughout our conversation is I asked a lot of questions that I would consider simple questions. Yeah. Like, what is a lunar eclipse? What are the moon phases? What is a solar eclipse? And at least they were honest by saying that they don't know. Um, it's interesting to me how the flat Earth position, my, my wife pointed this out to me after this discussion. She watched the whole thing. Uh, thank you, honey, for doing that. She said they don't have a model, and so all they do is they pick apart everything else, but they they don't have a model. So they can just say, we don't have a model, we don't know, we're just going to poke holes in your stuff. And so I do think it's significant that they do not know what a lunar eclipse is, and I also think it's significant that we have a model, it makes a lot of sense, and it works. (laughs) So let's go ahead and continue. But by the way, I'm about to, uh, in this next clip here, I'm going to explain uh, the moon phases uh, because the moon phases are significant when it comes to eclipses. Yeah. And let's watch that here real quick. Awesome. All right. So guys, all this is, is it's a styrofoam ball. I stole one of my wife's Christmas ornaments. She let me styrofoam ball. And then I colored it with a Sharpie. Okay. So there's no manipulation or anything going on right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain um, something that's very important for everybody to understand when we talk about eclipses, which is moon phases, okay? So this is very simple. This white side of the moon here is the side that is lit up. So from a geometric standpoint, with a single light source, a sphere can only be lit on half of it at one point in time. So if we look at this here, this side would be the side that the sun is lighting up. This would be the dark side of the moon, the side that the sun is not lighting up. Okay, so this is very important. Really quick, I just want to go through the phases here. So this is what we refer to as a full moon, which is when the side that's lit up is facing the earth. And then as we turn it here, when you see the half moon, it's because the side that's facing the earth, you can only see half the side that's lit. When we keep going, you're going to see your crescent moon there. Remember, this is just a straight line creating all of these shapes. There's your crescent moon. 
And then this is what we call a new moon. A new moon is when the opposite side of the moon to the earth is the one that's lit up and the dark side is what's facing the earth. So not only do we have the dark side, we've got a bright light, which is the sun over here, which is why we don't see a new moon. Okay, so that's very important. That's how the phases of the moon work on yeah. the globe model. Okay, so pretty simple explanation using a styrofoam ball and a toothpick. <laughs> and every phase of the moon that we see uh, can be seen there with that uh, little, little piece of styrofoam, that styrofoam ball. Uh, something else that's fascinating to me is the flat earthers really, for the most part, refuse to say that the moon is a sphere. Yeah. And you can demonstrate that the moon is a sphere very simply. But do you know why at... they have to say that? No. Why is that? Because because depending on where you are on flat earth, you're on a different side of the moon. And if you're on a different side of the moon, you would have to see a different portion of the moon. So if if the moon is uh, if the GP of the moon, the, the, the point on the earth directly underneath the moon is in, uh, you know, over the equator and somebody is looking at the moon from the southern tip of South America. And let's say that the moon is north of them and then somebody's in uh, uh united states looking at the moon well one's looking due north and the other is looking due south if the moon is small than local as they constantly say you'd see a different half of the moon and then a, a, an overlapping portion of the bottom of the moon but you never see that everybody sees right. the same part of it so they have to deny that the earth that the moon is a sphere because it instantly contradicts them and so as I did throughout this discussion, I demonstrated what the globe model says, and then I simply asked them about their model. And so let's listen to his answer here. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. On, on the moon phases real quick. Uh, I was curious, wh what is a full moon and what is a new moon on your model? Good question, man. I think it's, a, I think it's probably like a magnetic cycle and just like the center of a barrel cell image of a magnet, it's just completely black. It's actually just pure inertia in the center, in the ferrous image of a magnet. I think that's what it is. It just actually goes into its its inertial state and then charges <laughs> back up. And once it becomes like etherically displaced again, you start to see it charge up throughout a cycle. And then it goes back. Really speculation. I don't know what the moon is at all. It's a very beautiful thing. The creator made the heavens so that you can't understand them, so that you have to acknowledge that he. Okay, so I have no idea what he was talking about. Nobody does. That. With magnets and inertia, I, I don't think it was even a valid answer. No, but I but he also did admit that he doesn't know what a new moon is and what a full moon is. He should have just said he didn't know, instead of all that word salad. Right now, this is important because when you when you talk about eclipses, um, the science science is largely about making predictions and testing them. Yes, and so. The, the globe model actually makes predictions. I have said for a long time now that the flat earthers and the flat earth model doesn't predict anything. Yeah. And I think they're afraid to predict things because there's a really good chance that those predictions will not come true. Well, they, they know 100% it will be false. Right. Because yeah, they've been so, burned before that not nothing makes sense. They can't even predict the angle of sunrise because all the maps that they like to look at the sun, sunrise angle is wrong. Just that simple thing. Yeah, I set all of this up for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted the audience to understand new moon, full moon, the different yeah. moon phases so that we could talk about eclipses. But I also wanted to point out something that the globe model predicts. And here's what it is. All, all I, all I want to say is this. According to our model of the moon being a sphere, okay, and a full moon being the side that's lit and the new moon being the side that's dark, that means that a lunar eclipse, <clears throat> that means that a lunar eclipse would always be on a full moon and a solar eclipse would always be on a new moon. That's what the globe model would predict. Are you guys willing to admit that that is always what happens? 
That's what the we made is. the globe earth model from the sky, brother. H hold on. I just want you guys to admit that what I just said is true. It's true, and it's what the globe model predicts, and it's what the flat earth predicts, and it's what the anti well, me mechanism predicted, and what the Babylonians predicted with the flat earth belief okay. back the 3000 cycles with the BC. Chaldeans, 2500 BC. Okay. So, so the flat earth model predicts it now. Yes. Apparently. What flat earth model? Yeah, and, and, and it, what's interesting is that what, I, what I'm talking about is, I, is I'm actually talking about an explanation, right? Yeah. So if a full moon means that the side of the moon facing the earth is the side that's being lit up, uh, that tells us something. And it tells us that a solar eclipse, which is when, uh, which is when the moon comes in between the earth and the sun is going to be a new moon because the opposite side of the moon is lit up and a lunar eclipse is always going to be a full moon. So literally that is an explanation of how it works. And that is always the case 100% of the time. I know it was hard to hear it in there, but they did, they did admit it. Yeah. But then they said that they predicted too, which they don't. He said the sorrow cycles predict sorrow cycles is just actually a table of numbers to I don't think Witsit knows that. It's just a table of numbers. Yeah. That's all it is. So anyway, I I knew I knew where they were going to go when we talked about lunar eclipses, which yeah. is the Selenelian eclipse. And this is pretty significant because I was prepared to talk about this. Austin said something false, and I called him out on it. Uh, but let's talk about it real quick here, and let's listen to what he says. Explanation. It's a geometric impossibility. It's called the impossible eclipse. And we did not call it that. That's just what it's called. First recorded in 1666, allegedly. And it is where the sun and the moon are both observed to be above the horizon during the lunar eclipse, which is impossible geometrically because the sun is, of course, going to have to be below the earth so that the earth can block the light up onto the moon and cast a shadow. Okay. So he just described what a Selenelian eclipse is. I don't think after this discussion, he fully understands what they are. I didn't know what they were until I got into this whole flat earth debate stuff. And essentially what it is, is, is it's something that actually happens with every single lunar eclipse. And if you're in the right spot on the earth, that's the only time this happens. And it only happens when the sun and the moon are right at the horizon. So you literally, if you're, if you're looking at the moon, you'd, you'd have to turn around 180 and look the other way and, and you'd see the sun and they're both right at the horizon. That is what a Selenelian eclipse is. And uh, he actually first described it wrong. He said both the sun and the moon are above the horizon, which is not true. The second time he described it, he said they are observed above the horizon, which is closer to it being true. So let's quickly listen to this clip. Okay. Um, okay, so th the reason I'm saying that the lunar eclipse is impossible on a flat earth is because you don't have an explanation as to what it is and uh the um, the, the quote-unquote impossible eclipse you only used one word that was really accurate which is that it's observed the first time you described it you said they're both above the horizon which is false the second time you described it you said they're observed which is accurate there's a difference there's a difference between where something physically is and where something is physically observed right if you look in a mirror you can observe something but that's not where it physically is okay so I, I had to make that point yeah, because of what we're going to be talking about. And it's funny because when I rewatched this, I, I would sometimes kind of look at what Jaron was doing and, I, and it looked like he was agreeing with me here, that there's a difference between where something is observed and where something actually is. And so now I'm going to ask him the million dollar question with Selenelian eclipses, which he gets wrong. Here it is. So, uh, do you agree that the Selenelian eclipse only happens on the horizon? No. Okay, you're wrong. 
And I want everybody that's watching to Google cell and alien eclipses and read about it, and they will read that it only happens at the horizon. So you are wrong, Austin. What do you mean? That is not correct. Horizon. We actually have video yeah, documented video. evidence that you can see the sun up above the horizon as well as the moon. Right now, yes, based on the cycles that they happen, they it gets closer to when it the, the, the sun is quote unquote setting. So your you just say the claim. You're claiming that it's an illusion. The sun's not actually where we see it. It's actually below the earth. It just looks like it's up above the earth. I haven't I haven't talked about that yet. But I, but I am what you have to say. You. Well, that's what you say. Selenellians are only observed just before sunset or just after sunrise. But that's and when it's the... only when both bodies are just above the horizon. You're you're wrong. That that's, is not true. That is true. Okay. So this is definitely true what I'm saying. Yes. And what's interesting is he eventually asked the audience if they could find a video. Yeah. Uh, and I actually admitted during this discussion that if he could show me a video of, of the moon way up in the middle of the sky and, and there being a Selenelian eclipse, that I was wrong. Yeah. And that's something that I don't think they like to do very often is admit if something can be demonstrated, they're wrong. That they will never so, agree to anything that could potentially falsify flat earth. Never. I, right. I asked Jaron to, to, I said, Hey, let's, here's a fun idea, Jaron. How about we both get five things that would falsify our, our, you know, flat earth or globe. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I got, I got my five right. He's like, Oh, no, no, I, I, he wouldn't do it. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. So, so anyway, uh, he claimed in this discussion later on that someone found the video and that he posted it in Telegram, which I'm not a part of. Yeah. And so it sounded like to the audience that he was right. And so at the very end of the four hours, I asked him live if he could send me the link and I watched it while we were talking. And as I suspected, he was wrong. So the first thing I want people to see is the first link that I was given was to a rumble video. And here's a screenshot of the rumble video. Now, uh, that is the, the, the words on the screen there are Italian and I don't know Italian. So I translated it and it translates to sun about to rise oh. in Italian. So what you're going to notice here is that if this if this is truly a Selenelian eclipse, which I have no evidence of it, there is no sun yet. There's sunlight, but there is no sun. The Selenelian eclipse is where the sun and the moon yeah. appear above the horizon. This is just sunlight. So that's that's the first problem. Is the only way for him to show a video which would prove him right is for somebody to show the moon up in the sky turn their camera around and you can see the sun above the horizon. And so here, the, the first example they gave on Rumble is not a, it does not work. It actually says the sun is about to rise, but you don't see it. Now, he then kept talking about a video from 2017 that he said proves that he's right and I'm wrong. Well, let me talk about that. The reason he said the video was from 2017, I'm sharing it now, is because of this flat earther. <laughs> so this is some flat earther called The World is a Lie Sweden. <laughs> and it says, Selenelian Lunar Eclipse 2017 debunks the ball earth. And so here's the funny thing. I saw this video before the debate, and I was prepared to talk about this particular video and this video doesn't help him either. This video is actually from 2011. It's the flat earther that uh, reposted it, claiming it was 2017. So he's got the year wrong. Oh, they, here's the they do that a lot. Video. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the original video. It's from it's from 2011. Nice. And then I want you to listen to a quick clip from the video. Give me one second here. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let me share this real fast. Okay, listen to what he says here. Well, it is now officially 7.08, and if you look behind us, the sun is just starting to peek up over the trees. We can't quite see the sun, and behind us, yeah, the moon has pretty much disappeared into eclipse, but <laughs> otherwise it would be setting right now, but it has been fully eclipsed oh, yeah, for right just on a the few edge. minutes, so it disappeared just a couple minutes ago. And you can just see a sliver of the sun through the trees there. You see it now? Uh, can you see it in the camera? Zoom, zoom. There's it's right, zoom it's right. Lens. There's a tiny little sliver of brightness coming through the trees as the sun is peeking up. Okay, wow. so for, for, for the audience that doesn't understand what's going on here, the video that he claims proves he's right is exactly what I predicted and exactly what I said. So the, the, this couple here was, was filming this, and as the moon was, was going down, uh, the sun was not yet above the horizon. And when the first bit of the sun, which is right there, it's a tiny sliver that you can't even see. She had to point to it with her finger. He said, the sun is barely coming through the trees. He then said, but the moon is now gone. <laughs> so again, the way these work is both the sun and the moon have to be right at the horizon. And, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, things, strange things happen at the horizon. Uh, th there's there's things that happen with the atmosphere that create optical illusions. The one point he brought up that I thought was a valid point was that this particular eclipse here eclipsed the wrong way. So the shadow started at the top of the moon and went to the bottom of the moon when you'd think it would be the other way around. And again, I don't know exactly why that happens, but I will say this. These, these Selenellian eclipses only happen when they're both at the horizon, so we know something is going on with the, with the atmosphere because it's right above the surface of the Earth. The second thing I'll say is this. If you just have a glass of water or a fish tank, okay, if you look at something through just a regular piece of glass, there's not a lot of distortion, okay? If you're looking at, at through a fish tank, through the main part of the fish tank, there's not a lot of distortion. When you go to the corner of the fish tank, where there's the curve or the 90 degree angle, that's when things get wonky. Fish start to stretch, fish start to double, they start to appear where they're not. If you take a glass of water, a clear glass of water, and you just take like a ping pong ball behind it and you go like this, it shows up over here first, even though the ball is over here. So uh, optical illusions do happen they happen with the atmosphere. As I mentioned earlier, the flat earthers like to talk about the atmosphere doing things with the size of the moon and the sun. So even they get this. And so that is the answer to the Selenellian eclipse. Yeah. And to, to give a little more, um, Witsit likes to talk about, well, how did they know how much refraction you would can... happen um, <clears throat> because of the, you know, that how do they know ahead of time how much refraction would happen? Well, the the primary refraction in for seeing things that are outside of the atmosphere is the entire stack of the atmosphere. And the entire stack of the atmosphere has a pressure gradient from one atmosphere to about zero. So that that particular gradient is very consistent. The bottom kilometer, and especially the bottom even less than that, is is highly variable. So when you're looking at things right on the edge of the horizon, you get a lot of variability. But when they're slightly above it, then then uh, it's it's a bit more consistent. Yeah, the the lower levels of the atmosphere are also the thickest, so that's part of why you're you're getting that. Yeah. So up next is solar eclipses. Can, can and... I? I want to show yeah. something um, that you have on screen right now. Yeah. So you you paused. So all this time that they love to talk how they don't have a, a, a model, how they won't commit to a map, but they have the map on screen constantly. But here, this shows why the moon is a problem for them for phases. So it might be a little difficult to see, but the moon is, is a little, yeah, there you go. It's a little less than half, a 
illuminated. And you can see just, a, just above the moon there is Madagascar. So imagine a viewer in Madagascar looking at the moon. They would see the dark side of the moon and some of the bottom of it. So they might see a little bit of light on the bottom of the moon on flat Earth. Yeah. Right? But mm -hmm. then then take an observer over there on the the west coast of Africa, the northwest coast of Africa, maybe. They would they're on the opposite side of the moon as somebody in Madagascar. And so they would see almost completely the lit side of the moon and and it would be a full moon for them. Wow. But in reality, both of those observers see the same portion of the moon. So that's why they have to deny that the moon is a sphere. That's why they have to just punt and say, we don't know what the moon is. Because there is no plausible mechanism to explain what the moon is for flat Earth. Everything that you that you could conceive of, that, that they have conceived of, is easily attested and shown to be wrong. Yet they still use this, this app. These two people, Jaron and Austin, who specifically reject this map, have it on screen right now. Great Cause, point. Because it's and their it's map. To, yeah, it, it, go, it goes into exactly what the next clip is. So, so here we go. Yeah. Here, here's what uh, Austin admits in this next clip. So again, in the globe model, a solar eclipse is when the moon comes in between the sun and the earth. What is a solar eclipse on the flat earth model? The same. Austin, do you agree? Um, well, it may not be exactly the same as far as which one's in front of the other one, that kind of idea, but generally we know well, that it happens when the moon is at new moon. Is that what you mean? There's, there, there, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a serial cycle of eclipses. You're asking like the actual cause. I don't even know what the sun and the moon are, bro. <laughs> okay. So again, they, they really don't know. He, he says he doesn't know what the sun and the moon are. Um, and, and really, again, they, they don't really understand solar eclipses. Um, I don't think I have this clip, but actually maybe I do. But anyway, Jaron made a mistake. I don't know if it's because he doesn't fully understand eclipses or what, but he was talking about the moon catching up to the sun yeah. uh, versus the sun passing up the moon. But in the solar eclipses, I wanted to talk to them about the predicted paths of totality, which happen uh, all the time, by, of course, the globe model. And so here's what they had to say. You guys all know about the solar eclipse in the United States on April 8th this year? Coming, yes. Austin, do you know about it? Um, no. <laughs> okay. There, there's, a, there's a really big deal, which is a, a, a total solar eclipse. It's going to cross the United States he knows about it. on April 8th of this year. So my, mm -hmm. question, my question for you, Austin, is, is that there, there's, are you familiar with the term path of totality? Yeah. Okay, so they're predicting a path of totality, and it's very specific. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that the, that the path of totality prediction by the globe model will end up being right? Yeah, probably pretty close. Okay, and how? In what is your understanding as to how they predict that path of totality specifically? Uh, they probably run it through the spherical model, but we have a we have a equivalent flat Earth one. We we, we have an eclipse. We have a we already made one an eclipse model that predicts the locations of the eclipses as well. Okay, so that's interesting. I've never I heard mean, anyone say that before. Me neither. I can't believe he said that. And he didn't provide it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but he didn't provide it. That was pretty shocking to me. Now, something else he just said, in case you missed it, he, he won't he provide said it. That, that that these paths of totality are are run through the spherical model. Yes. And, and and right before that, he said it will be right, that the path predicted for April 8th will be right. So he admitted it will be right. He admitted it's run through the spherical model. And then to rescue himself, he said, but we have a model too. Yeah, there it is. I, yeah, I have it. The, the The cool thing about this book is that it's 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 a physical book. It's not just something online. They can't go change it. You can buy this ahead of time. I have it right now in my hands. And if it's wrong, if it's wrong, that's a problem for us. I'm so certain wow. that it's right that I'm spending my own money to drive myself down to Texas to watch it. Powerful. So. I 
brought something to them that they had never seen before. And let's let's l look at this now. That's a lot. All right, well, I'm about to show you a model you've never seen. So I looked far and wide, and maybe I missed it, Austin and Jaron, but I could not find any uh, flat Earth uh, example where the eclipses were modeled on the flat Earth map. Yeah, we so, have one. So if you go, if you can look up, uh, <laughs> you know, again, these maps of these eclipses, not only what it's going to be on April 8th, what, what it was in the past. And so I took the actual paths that both happened, solar eclipses on, on the Earth, and that will happen, and I mapped them on a flat Earth map because I could not find any flat earther that had done it, and I want to share it with you guys right now. Sure. I think Flat Earth Test has done it. I'll have to check with them. Cool. So let's take a look at this really quick because there's two things kind of that cool. stand out to me. Well, let me share. Sorry, I wasn't sharing. That's okay. Okay. Should we good to go? Let me bring this up. Cool. Uh, that's the wrong size. Let me go there. So, there so again, go. these are past eclipses and upcoming eclipses of where they actually happen and of where and of where we say they're going to happen, which again will be, you know, I believe will be accurate. And I noticed two things. Isn't it weird that the southern eclipses are longer than the northern eclipses? That doesn't make sense to me. Why would that be the case? Hmm? Why would on a flat earth map, why would southern eclipses like this monster right here, why are they longer in the south than they are in the north? I don't know anything about this. I don't know anything Someone about this model. That's okay. That's okay. And again, Somebody you guys are model. seeing this for the first time, but I think this is very telling hmm. because in your model, an eclipse should not be longer in the south. If anything, it would be shorter because you guys say the sun moves faster in the south than it does in the north. Oh, there's your answer. The sun moves faster, so the moon has a harder time catching it. Exactly. That would make the eclipse shorter, Jaron. No, it would make it longer. The moon has a harder time catching the sun. If this, if the sun is moving faster, right? Well, number one, the moon would the moon would never quote unquote catch the sun. That's what it does. No, no, no. An eclipse in your model or ours would be the sun passing up the moon. Okay, I see what you're saying. If you're talking about okay, going great. that way, the second thing I noticed was retrograde. We have retrograde here in the 2021 eclipse, and we've got major retrograde here in the upcoming 2026 eclipse. I'm going to suggest right now that total. Uh, solar eclipse retrograde is impossible on a, in, on the flat earth model. Okay. So this was significant for me. Um, and again, I feel like they, they, they don't want to map things out themselves on their own map. Oh, no, it's testable then. But not only do we have historical eclipses, uh, they, they end up, they end up taking issue with me that the retrograde is happening over Antarctica and what's funny about that is they agreed that our predictions of the eclipses come true. Like they said, the path of totality is going to be accurate in April. Yeah. And so these, so, so it's, it's almost as if our, our model is right until our model says that the eclipse goes over the South Antarctica. And then all of a sudden it's wrong. So this, this here, a friend of mine helped me with significantly, and this took a lot of time. So we used the latitude and longitude of the eclipse paths on the Earth, and we put them onto the latitude and longitude on the flat Earth map. And this shows that their map is bogus. As we already talked about, things get wonky as you on this map as you get further to the outside, like the shape of Australia. It's doing that to these eclipse paths as well. They shouldn't be longer. Uh, and, and again, because they say the sun has to go faster because it's making a bigger circle and it's still a 24 hour day, these eclipses should be shorter because the solar eclipse is being caused by the shadow of the moon. So if the sun is moving faster, it will zip past the moon yeah. and the shadow will be shorter. <clears throat> So anyway, th this was this caught them off guard, which I think is fine. Hopefully they'll look into it. But if they actually map out these eclipse paths, they they do not they, they, their model will not be able to make sense of this 
they're going to have to say that this is not accurate, but this is absolutely accurate. Yeah, th you did trap them pretty well because they agreed that the path of totality is correct. So they right. can't come back then and say the path of totality needs to be proven. They've already agreed. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, the next thing we talked about, which is one of my favorite things, is the Himawari 9 Japanese weather satellite. For, for those in your audience who are not familiar with it, it's a... Uh, geostationary satellite that's about 22,000 miles or so above Earth. What makes this weather satellite so special is they take a full disk image of the Earth every 10 minutes. Now, in the world of space photography, full disk means an entire hemisphere. Yeah, it doesn't, mean a, quick, it doesn't mean a spinning pancake disk in space. Right. Now, real quick, before I play this clip, I want to share something with the audience, which is I'm going to go to the website right now, and I'm going to share this with everybody. So I just went to this website, which is the Himawari's website. The uh, website here is in the upper left if you ever want to go to it. So this, this image... <laughs> This full disk image of the Earth was just taken less than an hour ago. Minutes ago, this was taken. I don't know the exact time it was taken, but it was taken very recently. And in the discussion, they were trying to, they, they first said that, that, that what I'm saying is not true, that it doesn't take a full disk image of the Earth every 10 minutes. And they were wrong on that. And I proved it to them. They don't understand how the website works. They don't know how to go into the back end and, and get the downloads. And I also had to explain to them the difference between Japan time and our time with how this Japanese website works. Yeah. Then Austin tried to say that when you zoom in on this picture here, which is not the best picture because you can download the 400 megapixel pictures of the earth in the download section. But he said when you zoom in on this picture, you can see purple stitch lines like this thing is being made uh, from other data. And he's wrong on that. So you can zoom in as much as you want. And you're going to see the incredible resolution here. And that, oh, by the way, speaking of Australia, here's another photo of <laughs> Australia from space. And what do you know? It matches the shape on the globe map exactly. Now... I want to uh, now that I'm zoomed in. And by the way, you can zoom in fully. There's no purple stitch line, so I don't know if he was on a slow computer or what. But I want to point out three things here. Um, flat Earthers like to say we don't have any real pictures of Antarctica from space. Here's one. It's not the best one, but that's Antarctica down there. Here's Australia, and then this right here is New Zealand. So we're going to talk about New Zealand here in a little bit. But I want you guys to know something. I have a friend in New Zealand. He's a really good friend of mine. His name is Drew. And what I did, Mike, right before we started tonight, is I looked at New Zealand. I zoomed in on this image, which again was taken less than an hour ago from space of our Earth. I zoomed in on New Zealand and I noticed there was very little cloud cover. Okay. Yeah. And I asked Drew, because he's the only person I know that lives on the Southern Hemisphere, I asked him to do me favors all the time, do experiments. I ask him questions about how things work down there. And one of the things I've asked him to do recently was to take pictures of the movement of the sun for me. And I gave him specific instructions. He's been complaining for a week that the cloud cover has been so thick he can't take pictures of the sun. So right before we went live, so an hour ago, I pulled up this image and I noticed there was very little cloud cover over New Zealand. So I sent him a quick message and I said, hey, I'm guessing you've got a clear, sunny day right now. And he responded and he said, it's perfectly clear. So I was able to use this image to know what the weather is right now in New Zealand. So the idea that these images are faked and that they're faking a new image every 10 minutes is ridiculous. So let me go back to the video and let's listen to this because one of the powerful things of the Himawari is that it captures catastrophic events on the earth as they happen. These are catastrophic events 
that are done in seconds or minutes, it catches them because it's taking a full disk image of the Earth every 10 minutes. So here we go. Prove it to me. Uh, because this satellite takes a full disk image of the Earth every 10 minutes, mm -hmm. it catches catastrophic events that no one even knew took place, such as volcanoes in the middle of the ocean. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Okay. And I'm going to, and I'm going to pull this up. And I'm going to share it. Okay. Here we go. You're sharing. Cool. You guys can see that? We can. This is really famous. <laughs> this is the Hunga Tonga volcano. And the Hunga Tonga volcano uh, is in the middle of the ocean. It's actually underwater. Mm -hmm. And so this, it, this volcano erupted. And uh, because it was in the middle of the ocean, no one really knew that it happened until That's not how that works, bro. Se <laughs> seismic. Activity. They have buoys out everywhere in the ocean. They can know Hold when there's on. a change it's, at all. No, no, it's a no. cool story. Sounds good. No, it's, it's not a cool story. This is real. This is a real picture. It's a real event that happened. Okay. So in case you guys can't see it, the, the, the volcano's in the middle of the ocean. So that's it right there. That's the explosion of this volcano. And they interrupted me. But what I was trying to say is that no one really knew this volcano erupted until after the fact. They pushed back on me and claimed that, oh, no, they, they would they, they would hear. They, yeah, they would have all the seismic information and the buoys and all that kind of stuff. So let me share something really quick which is a highlighted article online. I'm going to read two lines from it. All right. So it says here at the top, after staying relatively inactive since 2014, the Hunga Tonga volcano erupted on December 20th, okay, sending particulates into the stratosphere. Now, here's the key. By the way, that, that eruption was caught on the Himawari, that one. But here, here's the important one, which is the picture I showed. As activity on the island decreased, it was declared dormant by the Tonga Geological Services on January 11th, 2022. A large eruption commenced on January 14th, sending clouds of ash 12 miles into the atmosphere. So literally three days after this was declared dormant, it erupted again, and the eruption was massive. It was many magnitudes greater than the other one. And that is uh, what I'm showing here. And so they were wrong. This I eruption have a, actually caught everyone off guard. Uh, this is a, this is an important thing here. Um, they said they have seismic buoys. And, and so that their implication is somehow that the seismic buoys gave them the information so that they could construct the the picture because their their claim is that this picture is constructed that it's not taken from space um so the question i have then is how how did how could you know and and maybe you could maybe you can't and so phd tony's in the chat he has a bit of expertise in this particular field from seismic buoys within less than 20 minutes let's say of of uh, an event like this happening could you know if there will be a giant plume uh, going into the sky just from seismic buoys because of course none of the seismic data would have gotten to any of the the uh you know habitated areas where they have on land seismic um measuring instruments so just these buoys that would have to be that are floating in the water that they're saying i don't know anything about the buoys so just to you, uh, who, anybody specifically, I know Tony might have some background in this. Yeah, great point. Um, one of my favorite points to make about the Hunga Tonga volcano has to do with the sound of it. And so I'm going to play that right now. So within, within minutes of this happening, we have a photo of it. And you ready for this? Here's the fascinating thing. Uh, the sound of the eruption was so big, it reached New Zealand, but it took two hours to reach New Zealand. So we actually had a picture of it before the people in New Zealand even heard the initial eruption. That's how powerful this satellite is, the Himawari 9. Okay. 
Okay. So, <laughs> so they, they were kind of speechless there for a, for a bit. Um, th this is very significant. <clears throat> this, this image here was taken and available for download by anyone in their living room before the people in New Zealand heard the original eruption happen. Yeah. People, people need to let that sink in. Now, they, they gave me a hard time in the discussion that the images are not instantly downloadable, which is silly. Um, we, we, we determined that the images for us, just, just regular, you know, regular Joes, can download them around 30 to 40 minutes after they're taken, which I think is pretty incredible. What flat earthers don't realize is they think everybody's out to get them, everyone. So they think this entire thing, the, the satellite, the, the rockets that, that launched these satellites in Japan, all these images, which is now over 400,000 of them because they take one every 10 minutes, they think all of this is to just refute flat earthers and to convince us all we live on a globe. No one's even thinking about that. The purpose of this is to be able to understand weather, weather patterns, see hurricanes develop, see tropical storms develop, try to predict these things in order to save lives. And that happens. We can see things happening on here and, and you know, tsunamis wipe out, you know, countries that are yeah. very poor and, and they kill thousands of people. And so this actually is to save lives and we can see things and, and get warnings out. And so the data from this satellite doesn't go to us first. Uh, and, and it, it goes to the people that need it the most first. And so I think the whole thing is ridiculous. I don't think there is a rebuttal to this. Uh, th this is clear that we live on a globe. There's no evidence that the pictures are faked. And just the thought of faking these pictures every single 10 minutes, everything on the pictures is accurate, meaning the clouds, the weather. If there's a flood, you can see it on the land. If there's a fire, you can see the smoke. If there's a volcano, you can see the plume. Everything here is accurate on these photos. And just the thought that they're, they're somehow, I don't even think it's possible, faking these every 10 minutes is insane. It, it's very telling. So we, I, I got a little bit of information from um, PSG Tony. He says that, that you can get the focal point. You can know where it is. But uh, but from the seismic buoys, you, you couldn't tell. This is just... Uh, take take it for what it is, people. Um, he, he's he's uh, responding in a in a in a live chat response to something that could probably uh, take up multiple peer reviewed papers. Um, uh, that that the 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 seismic data you get from buoys wouldn't would not tell you what the the plume would would look like, or if they're you know how high it would go, yeah. or what size, or anything like that. Yeah, it makes total sense. All right, so a couple more. Um, now we're going to talk about flights. So let's listen to this clip really quick. I mean, I don't know why you had to go as far out as you did. But <laughs> I want. But I would say the more accurate thing is that people were talking about why are there not that many southern flights? Ah, direct because there are way shorter paths that go straight there, and the vast majority of them go out of their way up north. And people just say stuff like, oh, it had to stop for fuel. No, it did, it no. needs more fuel to go up there. And that is a fact that the vast majority of flights uh, are not Southern to Southern. These are, this is a very rare flight as in out of all of the flights, it's basically an anomaly, not saying it's fake. I'm saying that's a fact. And that flights from the South, they go up North out of their way many times. And there yeah. are many times we can show that the path makes more sense on a plane earth than a globe earth and would cost extra money. Okay. So this is a common flat earth claim that flights in the southern hemisphere go up to the northern hemisphere and then go back down to the southern hemisphere and they claim that it's because of this flat earth map that you see on the screen uh, again this, leveraging their model yes that's right their model that doesn't that they don't have um now this is this one was very simple for me the first time i heard it i was like wow do they really think that uh, the answer for this is economics. 90% of the people live on the earth, live on the Northern hemisphere. Very few people live on the Southern hemisphere. And so, you know, airlines are not in the business to lose money. They're not going to take half empty flights. They're going to make sure they have full flights. 
They've got people that want to go to different locations. And so they, they understand this. That is the answer. And so I'm going to present that here and we can listen to it. And then we'll hear Austin's response, which was weak, but I wasn't able to rebut it on the fly. So I'm going to rebut it here tonight. Here we go. To you and all flat earthers right now, why Southern Hemisphere flights often go into the Northern Hemisphere first. Okay. Okay. The answer is economics. <laughs> okay. You know that. You already and, preempted that. You already and, said that. Hold, hold on. Already said I, that. I know a thing or two about economics, so I can finally speak about something that I would consider myself, you know, very knowledgeable in. So here we go. I was talking to a friend of mine this week. And he said, hey, man, I'm going out of town. I've got to go to Philadelphia. So here we go. Here's a map. He's, he's in Denver as well. Uh, and so he's going from Denver to Philadelphia. But he said, you're not going to believe this. Frontier doesn't do a direct flight anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean they don't do a direct flight? And he's like, dude, just for me to go from Denver to Philadelphia, I have to go through Orlando. So if you guys don't trust me, go to Frontier's website and just try to find a flight from Denver to Philadelphia. You can't get a nonstop unless you go through either Tampa or Orlando. Okay? okay. Now, this does not mean that there is some crazy shape to the United States. This is economics. Okay. Okay. All right. So I, I'm surprised they don't know this, uh, but this is simple. Okay. Airlines have hubs. And they utilize those hubs to make things make the most amount of sense. So Austin's response to me, his only response to me on this, because again, their argument that Southern Hemisphere flights go into the north before going back down to the south has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. His response to me on this was that Frontier is a small airline. And so they don't have a lot of locations, he said, which I don't fully understand what he meant by that. And so that was his response. And of course, that's a weak response, and I couldn't respond to that on the fly. So, Austin, I went out to the biggest airline in the world, which <laughs> is Delta Airlines. By all categories, they are the biggest airline in the world. And I put in Denver to Philadelphia, the exact same destinations. And as you will see here, most of their flights, they do not have a nonstop from Denver to Philadelphia, and most of their flights go through Atlanta. So Denver to Philadelphia must go through Atlanta, which we will look at right here. And we will see that this, at first glance, does not seem to make a lot of sense. It's out of the way. Oh, no, it's again, the truth. They're hiding the truth. And again, you know, Delta's main hub is Atlanta. And so they route flights through Atlanta. And so, yes, a direct flight from Denver to Philadelphia would make more sense in a straight line, but it goes through Atlanta. Now, this is also funny. Uh, I noticed when I was looking at these flights that Delta had one other flight. If you, for some reason, don't want to go through uh, through Atlanta to get to Philadelphia, you can go through Salt Lake City. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with the geography of the United States, I went ahead and mapped this one out for you. So you can see how much sense this makes in your mind. Flying from Denver to Salt Lake City to get to Philadelphia means you're going in the exact opposite direction. Now, guess what? <laughs> Delta also has a hub in Salt Lake City. So this makes sense economically, but it might not make sense to our simple, feeble minds. <laughs> so anyway, this whole thing that Flat Earthers bring up about these flights not just going straight is not valid. There's a perfectly reasonable and rational explanation. And I brought up another flight on this discussion, which is absolutely devastating to Flat Earth. And I'm going to go ahead and show it right now. So this first picture here that I'm about to share is a still from one of Austin's videos. So you can see his logo in the upper right. That's his purple blue bar. 
And here was the still that I took. So he was playing a video that he apparently agreed with because he was agreeing with it the entire time about an emergency landing that happened in Fiji that proves flat earth. And here's the, uh, here's the image. It here. says it right on the screen there on Wits It's video. Right. And it's, and it's the model that they pretend they don't use. Right. Now I noticed something interesting, uh, when I was looking at this and again, you know, things keep coming back to New Zealand, but I've got a buddy in New Zealand. Uh, and I called him to see if he's ever taken this flight, the, the nonstop from JFK in New York to Auckland, New Zealand. He said, yes. And he said, when they take off in JFK, they fly Southwest. And if you look at this map, this is not Southwest at all. It's, it's almost Northwest That's because you're going from New York up into Canada to get to New Zealand. Now, this flight path does make perfect sense on the flat earth map. But, but that's not I, the path that it actually takes. Correct. Right? <laughs> it's not the path that it actually takes. <clears throat> so I looked up the actual flight path. There was a little bit of a confusion on the, on, the, on the discussion I had with them. I didn't look up this emergency landing flight because I don't know how to get historical information going back a couple of years. But I looked up the nonstop flight, which is right here, uh, from JFK to New Zealand. And what do you know? It goes southwest. It leaves New York, it travels across the United States, it travels across Mexico, and then it ends up here in New Zealand, which is uh, pretty much a straight line. So this flight path makes sense. The video and the still that Austin used, their, their flight path goes over Canada. And so I explain here in this next clip that you can't go over Canada and Mexico on the same flight. So let's go ahead and play that so, now. <laughs> Str Stringer News 1 says, Southwest, you said Delta. Southwest did the direction, not Southwest, the, the airplane company. Exactly. The airline. Okay. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Here's the screenshot so people can look at it. So Austin, I was watching your video and I paused it and I was like, wait a minute. I have a buddy that lives in New Zealand. So his name is Drew. He's probably watching right now. So I called him and I was like, dude, have you ever taken the flight, the direct flight from New York to New Zealand? He's like, of course. And I was like, dude, what direction does the plane fly? Oh and he's like, Southwest. Why are you asking me such a dumb question? And I was like, hold on, Drew. You're sure that the plane goes Southwest? Like we're talking like over Mexico. And he's like, of course. Why are you asking me such a dumb question? So I was looking at the flat earth map and I was looking at this emergency landing, Austin, and, I, and you'll notice, as I notice, that this flight goes over Canada. It does not go over the United Look States. It does not face. go over Mexico. It goes over Canada. And I was like, huh, that's peculiar. So what I did is I went to Flight Radar 24, which is the website that you guys use, and I looked up this flight. And let's look at it. Let's look at the flight path. What do you know? The flight goes southwest over the United States, over Mexico to New Zealand. So I'm going to suggest right now that we have a serious problem here. This flight either goes over Canada to get to New Zealand or it goes over Mexico to get to New Zealand. And if it goes over Mexico, the flat earth map is completely wrong. Hmm. How so? What do you mean? This is devastating, bro. How so? What do you mean? How? Explain why it's devastating. <laughs> All right. So there was no rebuttal to this. The only thing Austin said is he said, he, I, I had to throw in a bro there because that's what Austin always calls everybody. All Austin says, it says here is he goes, I rebutted it in 10 seconds, bro. There was no rebuttal. He so said, He didn't say a word. Just to make this clear for everyone, crystal clear, I went ahead and did their work for them. And I'm going to share this. So this is the flat earth map. And that is a straight line, which planes fly straight. That's something we're going to cover right now. Uh, that's a straight line from New York to Auckland on the flat earth map. That goes over Canada. It does not go over the United States. And that's what would make the most sense. When you're covering such a huge distance, this flight is one of the longest flights on the earth right now. It's it's over 17 hours long. It's a nonstop. 
you're going to want to go straight. And so that line there is what makes sense. And, and that's Fiji. And so the flat earthers are claiming that because one time the flight from New York to Auckland had to do an emergency landing in Fiji, that their map is right. Okay. Well, I just proved that this flight doesn't even take this path. The flight instead is now going to have to do a circle. Let me show it to you. Uh, flat earthers think planes fly in circles and they don't. I wish I would have brought that up in the, in the live discussion, but we're going to cover that now. So here is the actual flight path through the United States, cross Mexico, and then now turn and go to New Zealand. So here we go. Here, here's what must happen on that flight. Uh, uh, this is your captain speaking. I uh, just want to let you know we... Uh, We've now gone the wrong direction over two countries, uh, the United States and Mexico. And now that we've done that, we're going to go ahead and turn and we're going to start heading to New Zealand, which is your destination. And I just wanted to let everybody know, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt your dinner, but uh, we're going to have to bank the plane now. And I just want to make sure you don't spill your drink. So we're going to go ahead and start banking to the right so that we can head to your destination. Like, this is silly, right? <laughs> no, planes don't fly in circles. And flat earthers now think that southern hemisphere flights fly in circles. Uh, and so it's funny. They try to tell us, have you ever heard of a pilot that nose, noses down uh, with the curve? Which means they don't understand gravity, but that's a conversation for another time. Their position is crazy, which is that Ask a pilot if he's constantly banking because that's what these circle routes would, would cause. A plane can't really turn. They can't turn quickly and you feel it. If a plane turns, you feel it every single time. Planes try to fly as straight as possible. And what's funny is I actually asked Jaron about this after the discussion in a text. And he said, well... You, they wouldn't bank constantly and it would be so minor you wouldn't feel it that's oh, not true so it, minor you wouldn't feel it like the yeah. nose dip <laughs> yeah you, you feel banking but what's funny is is jaron's position is that it would just bank a little bit and then stop and in their model if it banks just a little bit and stops it's still headed in the wrong direction so at <laughs> some point it's got to bank again then when it banks again, it's still headed in the wrong direction. And then it has to bank again, and it's still headed in the wrong direction. Unless it's constantly banking to create a circle, it's going to have to consistently bank throughout the flight. No flight does this. And so I'm going to suggest that this flight, which I stumbled on by accident because I wanted to know what Austin thought about Southern Hemisphere flights, and I found the only video I could find on his channel. And in that video, he's got this emergency landing. And I was like, wait a minute. I need to call somebody that's been on this flight. And that's how I stumbled on the fact that it doesn't fly over Canada. It flies over the United States and Mexico in a straight line. They're going to have to say that it does this curve, but there's no reason for it to curve. Nobody on the flight feels it banking the whole time. So this is devastating for them. It, it certainly is. And so uh, planes tend to have, they, they go waypoint to waypoint. And when they get... They get to a waypoint, then they'll adjust for the next waypoint, and uh, typically that's that is a you know they 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 set the waypoints on a great circle as much as they can because it's the shortest route. Um, but of course, many things can cause them to be slightly off. Wind, uh, Coriolis, whatever sure. uh, can, can can cause it so that when they when they would get to the waypoint they're off of it by a bit but then they just adjust again for the next waypoint by adjusting their heading so it's a constant yeah. waypoint shifting and of course if you were to take the waypoints of that route that that actually flew and put it on their flat earth map you'd see that same curving that you saw there and every waypoint then would be a significantly larger bank than in reality that and so that's to your point there yeah, and by the way, in case someone out there is familiar with the term great circle route, and they're going to push back on me and say that the globe plane routes are a circle as well, that's not really accurate. The reason it's called a great circle route has to do with the curve of the Earth. 
a great circle route, if you go look it up, is straight. It's perfectly straight. The only curve is around the curve of the Earth. The so surface, it's, yeah. It, yeah, the great circle route is straight from one point to the other. The only curve you get, the reason it's called the circle, is the curve of the Earth. Yeah. Okay, last thing. This is a fun one. So Jaren gave me a challenge uh, in this video, and I'd like to respond to the challenge live here tonight, but let's first hear the challenge that he gave me. Our tops. That's All right, let's... Oh, well, so just you just want to ignore that. Ignore second. that there's no cruises. Yeah. I guess we can't find any cruises. People want to go to Australia to South America. They don't exist. All right, Jaron, here's all I'm going to predict because I don't know anything about cruises. Okay. Honestly, dude, I've never even been on a cruise. You should go um, on. It's pretty fun. I'm going to predict that just like Flat Earther said, Southern Hemisphere flights are fake. Mm -hmm. And we're wrong that they're going to be wrong on this one too. But I just okay. don't know anything about cruises. All right. So all find right. me a cruise. That's your. You said that, that I'm going to be wrong on that. So find me a cruise that goes directly from South America to, to Australia or New Zealand. I'll even give you New Zealand. You won't find I'll it. look. I will look. Okay. You know what you didn't do? You didn't get him to finish that sentence and say, or I will something. Yes. He didn't. I should have done he that. But he wouldn't. He's He's been through the ringer too many times. He knows he will never commit to anything falsifiable. Yeah, so this was interesting. He challenged me. I, I, I don't know anything about cruises. I've never researched cruises, but he challenged me to find a cruise that goes from South America to Australia. And he clearly said there twice, you won't find one, you won't find one. So I found one. Uh, and as I predicted, just like the Southern Hemisphere flights, which they said don't exist, they exist. Now he's saying these cruises don't exist and they do exist. Let me share my screen real quick. Cool. <clears throat> so this didn't take me too long, but this is a cruise. So it's this one here in the middle. Uh, it starts in <clears throat> San Antonio, which is near uh, Santiago, Chile, so right here, and it goes across to New Zealand and then to Australia. So exactly what he said, a cruise from South America to uh, Australia does exist. What's fascinating to me is that this cruise ends up going almost to Madagascar. Yeah, wow. So this almost completely goes all the way around the Southern Hemisphere. Now... In fairness to Jaron, I texted him about this prior to our discussion tonight, letting him know I was going to be presenting this and that I found one. And his response was, well, it's a long cruise. It's 48 days. And he said, they stop at the different islands here in the Southern Ocean. And I'm thinking to myself, so what? That's what cruises do. You, you challenged me to find a cruise, and I did find one. So I think this satisfies his challenge. And what's fascinating to me is if it didn't stop at those islands, which some of those islands are beautiful, right? Easter Island is there. Tahiti oh, yeah. is there. If it doesn't stop at those islands, you're going to be on a ship for like nine days without stopping. Who wants to be holed up in some interior cruise room without a window for nine days nobody the, the purpose of a cruise is to make frequent stops to see different places so anyway i i don't know if he exactly moved the goalposts, but it sure feels like it but again oh, that's a goalpost move yeah <laughs> here we go so so the cruise that he said doesn't exist does exist yeah he he wanted to amend his previous statement that it had to start in um in uh, South America and go nonstop to New Zealand. Right. Right. So anyway, those are just some of the highlights, Mike. It was a great discussion. I love, honestly enjoyed every minute of it. The, uh, it, it did not go well for the flat earthers. And I will say that I watched a couple of Austin's debates leading up to it. And I, I'd say this, it was probably three debates that I watched. The, the people that debate Austin come in a couple cat a few categories. One that I saw was somebody that had no idea what this debate is all about, knew nothing about Austin, came in completely unprepared. Then you've got the guys who are, you know, more credentialed and into science, and they end up getting frustrated with Austin, and they kind of show their anger uh, toward him, which I think is not a good look. I went in and I set the ground rules at the beginning, which was like, here's what I have studied. 
here's what I've researched, here's what I'm prepared to discuss. And so those are the topics I want to discuss. I don't know anything about the other stuff. And I think it went very well. I do too. I, I uh, thought it was a, uh, a very different than what uh, they used to, what they're used to, what Austin's used to. And you got him nervous many times. You could tell he's got a few tells. When he says, obviously, he's about to lie. When he says, bro, he's nervous. Um, you could see his, uh, you could see his eyes darting around and blinking. That's another one. So you got him, you got him going on all those. Uh, and then another is, of course, another of his tactics is to just constantly go to his script. He's got, he's got a bunch of scripts. He just likes to press play. And he constantly did that. And you, we didn't show that here because it's, it's, it's not to your, you know, it's not as interesting. Uh, but plus it's four hours. <laughs> so if you want to see it all, you can, you can go watch it. It's on Jaren's channel. It's still there. So, um, I've got some, some super chats and some feedback from the audience. If you, if you want to get some, let's, let's do it. That sounds uh, fun to me. First, we've got, we've got, I'll read just a, a cut, a sampling. You might want to come back and read the live chat afterwards, but, uh, we got okay. Greg Edmond says you smoked them. Will, uh, Bob says that was fantastic. Virilian said that was awesome. Or you did awesome. Uh, Ashton Richards says, Will the Slayer. Jeff C says, good job, Will. So um, uh, 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 there's a lot, a lot. So thank you to all those people that said that. Uh, we've, you've got Effed Up World is a friend of mine. He's a flat earther, lives not uh, not too far from me, quite a bit north of me. But I've met him in person. I'm still borrowing his, his P1000 camera. It's, I'll get it back to him. Um, but he says, he, he said that you look like Jake, the Jake hole, which I I, I don't think you do. Um, but uh, F, Joe, come on, G give us some positive feedback, Joe. Um, all right. Uh, Jiffy Jeff Wald says, don't worry, I'll gift, I'll give some gifties here and then gave some uh, memberships away. Five memberships. Thank you for that, Jiffy. I see Spin says, I'm here for the new nervous stupidity. Uh, I think that's uh, Witsit's uh, nervous stupidity. Burnham says, consuming flat earth particles liquefies brain cells, leaving behind a void. This is my evidence for the empty vat in head theory. That's funny. <clears throat> uh, Dan L. had a 499 super chat, but no message. So uh, thank you, Dan L. Uh, tag me if, if I got, if, I, uh, if, if you had something you wanted to say, I'll read it. Uh, Stringer News 1 says mountains, proof it's not flat. Let's see here. Get, get some for you to uh, respond to, maybe. MK Ultra, uh, so he lives in Israel. He says, Israeli flurf explanation for lunar phases. The moon fills and empties. That's how God made it. No human can understand it. All right. <laughs> Wits it leveraged that one a couple times, too. He's like, "Oh, we, we can't understand it because God God made it." Like, I don't get how you you'd have a crescent moon if it's being emptied or filled. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, and then MK Ultra said, "Apologies for the timing. I'm slightly behind the curve." So he, he was probably watching uh, from beginning and then at a higher speed it's a good way to, to do it you catch up peachy tony says we can do and use spherical trigonometry to calculate both distance and bearing flat earth can do neither calculation uh peachy tony's been around a long time he's in australia and uh uses gravity to find minerals and valuable resources for companies that do mineral exploration um how can cool. he do his job if gravity doesn't exist? Right. Um, Serena's once says, why are there no nonstop tra trains from South America to Australia? Tough one. I'll have to get back to him on that. <laughs> a, a, floating, a floating train the whole way. Uh, Peachy Tooney says, uh, people who get frustrated and annoyed, who could he be talking about? 
So PT Tony has debated Witsit. PT mm. Tony is a PhD, and you did describe what happened when he debated Witsit. Tony got flustered because Witsit, because this, you know, the things that they say are so ridiculous. Um, you know, making claims about how electricity works. That's not how it works. Uh, Witsit likes to do that one a lot. All right, here you go. Plastic Citizen says, great job, Will. This is for you. Uh, um, MC Tune, pass it along to him. So I guess I, I owe you five bucks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should I should come out to Colorado and uh, and meet you there. That'd be fun. Uh, medicinal mass media a friend of mine that lives in uh, in the Minneapolis area here not a flatty says come visit the MMM medicinal mass media discord and learn why you're wrong simply and utterly wrong just about everything you can think you might be good at or like mm. so he hosts debates on his server that are um, uh, all over the place, flat earthers and and others. So I've been on there, pretty good, uh, pretty good host of, of uh, all sorts of things. Cool. Uh, and and he has moderated me. So one thing I I, I, I gotta I tell people this, I try to get moderated when they're not a flat earther, right? I want them to I want to show that I get moderated too. So and if they're not, then that's a problem. They should. If I if I'm acting how you know how I should be mocked, then do it. So he's he does well. Mr. Beast's best part was the analogy at the end with Titanic. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you want to explain it briefly because we didn't cover it today. Yes, I forgot about that. I'm glad they brought that up. Uh, my wife said that was her favorite part of the whole discussion. So I started out the discussion by asking Austin and Jaron if they believe in the Titanic. And I, and I made it simple. I, I said, was there a boat? Did it sink? And is it at the bottom of the ocean? I was expecting them to agree with me. And Jaron said no. So it's interesting, but I think with flat earthers, you just really never know what to expect. But at least Austin agreed with me. And so I told them that I would bring it up later in the discussion which I did. So I came up with an analogy, which is, uh, which concerns the Titanic and it, and almost everything in the analogy is true. Meaning all of the names and the statistics are true. So I, let me just read this real quick. Cause I, I do think it's fun. So I call this, it's a thought experiment and I call this thought experiment shallow ocean. The ocean is actually shallow and not deep. The government wants you to believe the ocean is deep because the ocean actually has a glass bottom, a firmament, which separates the water above it from the water below it. And the glass bottom is less than a mile beneath the surface. So the Titanic was actually a setup by the government to convince the world that the ocean is actually very deep. They claimed to have built three identical sister ships, the RMS Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic. That's true, by the way. But they really only built two which is why no one ever saw all three at the same time and no picture exists of all three at the same time. So when the Titanic left port, it just went and docked somewhere else at night and the next day, everyone was told that the ship at the dock was the Titanic's identical sister ship, the RMS Olympic. And then a few days later, they claimed it sank and of course there is no evidence of this other than it was on TV and, the, and in the newspapers. I mean, no one videoed it sinking or took photographs of it sinking. Everyone was told the lie that the boat was at the bottom of the ocean miles and miles down. And then in 1985, this is also a true story, the U.S. Navy hired Robert Ballard to go look for two submarines. Submarines are also fake to make people believe the ocean is deep. And when Robert Ballard went on this top secret government mission to look for submarines, what do you know? He magically finds the Titanic. Fewer than 250 people claim to have visited the Titanic, but we know they are all lying and paid by the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, to perpetuate the lie. The NOAA is the equivalent of NASA, but for the ocean. Oh yeah, the supposed pictures and videos of the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean, those are CGI. So that's the thought experiment. 
And I put a lot of thought into that because it's, it's literally their exact arguments. Every piece of it is their argument. Everything is fake. Everyone's a liar. Every submarines aren't real. And so it's just fascinating to me. And so the reason I brought that up with them was I wanted them to understand what it's like for someone who doesn't agree with them to hear their arguments. And so I wanted them to agree that they believed the Titanic was really a boat, really sunk, and it's really at the bottom of the ocean, which Austin agreed with, so that he would disagree with my arguments and, and feel what it's like to hear these arguments. And so I think he absolutely felt it and heard it. And I, I didn't know if they were going to go into it at all, but if they were going to you know, challenge me on anything, every single piece of that analogy comes from them. Yeah. Like for example, they say rockets don't go to space. They say they, they go high in the sky and then they curve and go land somewhere else. So I say, okay, great. The Titanic just left port and then it just went to a different port. Um, th there's been about a little less than 300 people who have been on the ISS, the International Space Station. They say, nope, they've never been there. They're all liars. Well, only 250 people have actually been to the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. It's almost the same number. So it's like, okay, great. They're all lying. And so they believe it when it has to do with one thing, but then they have these crazy arguments that they don't see the silliness of them in their position. So that is shallow ocean. It was interesting because, because they had a different response. Jaron, Jaron's like, Oh, that could, I could I just in his head. He's like, I could just hear him thinking. Yeah, that's probably true. He, he probably bought everything at the afterwards, but wits it, wits it, had already committed that the the Titanic exists and that it, it sank. So he he couldn't change that. Jaron, as he always does, is non-committal completely. He's always non-committal. So he he can he can say what you know, waffle about whatever he wants later. But Wits had already committed. So he he tried to squirm. Oh my goodness, that was good. And it would be fun to hear them try to prove me wrong because I would only use their own arguments against them. If yeah. they say, well, we have pictures, well, I would just say those are CGI. Yeah, they're fake. We well, yeah. have people that well, were yeah. there. Oh, they're they're lying. Can't. Yeah, they're they're all Freemasons. Um, so, it was fun. That was, yeah, that was a good one. I, I watched that part of it twice now. Um, and uh, so I, you had... He so if you're following along, um, he you sent me that particular portion, and I watched that a couple days ago, uh, last week I think, and then just that section, and then uh, since then I watched everything from when I was I watched it live, through, uh, through the end of it, and I am like, well, I could skip this section, but I'm not. I'm gonna keep watching. I watched it again, um. So yeah, that was it. So Mr. B, a good point on that. Um, Stringer's one says Jared was Jaron was livid, never seen him so angry. Oh, it's easy to get him angry. Just just do anything with NASA, he'll get angry. <laughs> Jared hates NASA so much. Oh. Um, it's Rubik is a new member. Thank you. Jiffy, here's my Rubik. Uh Jiffy Jiffwald says, Have you ever tried? <laughs> Have you ever had a dream that you were, um, you had, you'd, you would, you could, you'd do you with you once you, you could do you. So you, you'd, you could, so you, you would want, you want him to do you so much. You could do anything. All right. <laughs> That's from a, I, I don't know if he, if he actually like quoted that, but it's a video of some kid talking and he can't he can't just put a sentence out uh frigid point four says titanic requires a container so if you saw the debate with dearth flat earth dave and uh professor dave uh professor dave said that spectroscopy needs a container which it doesn't it's just looking at light um, and the patterns of light you know what's what's in the light the components of it and what's not in it and it, it it's so it's such a dumb so dumb thing. So now everything the joke is everything needs a container. Uh, well, Burnham Burnham says the submarine videos were faked and were actually filmed in outer space pools. Yes, I like it. I like it. I love it. That's great. 
Uh, why is why isn't there phones of fish at the Titanic? Ha! Photos, I think. Photos of fish at the Titanic. Yeah. Oh, that's the, they're, they're talking about stars. I love There's it. I love no it. Stars. Well, that, that's absolutely true because you might not see fish in the photos of right. the Titanic, but there's billions of fish in the ocean. Why can't you see it? Right. Um, so good. Charles Arnold says, I made Jaron mad by accusing him of flurfing for money. I made Jaron mad by accusing him of that. And I took it back. I apologize to him for that because he convinced me that he's serious. It's great. Um, I I don't for the most part I don't think that they are fake. I think there's a couple, uh, but I think that it's a psychological condition, right? I think that Witsit believes his lies. There's a, there's a name for that. Psycholo uh, pathological liars believe their lies. Mm -hmm. I I think. That could be, you know, how how it is that they are in the position they are. They believe their lies. Yeah, they seem pretty sincere in their beliefs. Yeah, yeah. Um, Justin Messenger says, how deep is the ocean in sheep units? Uh, great job, Will. I live in the springs near Peterson. GL2F. Got a lot of flurf. Um, sheep units. Yeah, how deep is the ocean in sheep units there, Mr the shallow ocean guy i i ch in my in my thought experiment i chose less than a mile less than a mile all right so now we're gonna have to look up a mile in sheep units are you familiar with sheep units i am not so yeah it's it's the units of the future you know you've got imperial units you've got metric they're all going away it's all going to be scottish sheep units so uh, one sheep length is the snout to rump length of a two-year-old ewe, mm. which is 4.33 feet. Um, obviously, the Freemasons were involved because, <laughs> because it's got a 33 in it. Um, all right. So that would be one uh, 1.2 kilo sheep lengths. Got it. There you go. Now we know. <laughs> um, let's see. Pilo fourteen oh eight says Ocean Gate is the Columbia of shallow ocean. Yep, they all. It was all fake. They all faked their own death. They, right. Uh, they're, yeah. they're, oh. <laughs> I'm glad he brought. I'm glad he brought that up because if for us to keep this going, we would say that they faked their own deaths. That they're. They're still out there. They're using their same names. <laughs> yeah, they're going to fake their own deaths and then not use different names. <laughs> so st All right, here's the problem, Will. A year from now, two years from now, this is going to be a thing. And we're going to blame you. There's going to be shallow oceaners out there. Actually, there there are already people right away that, that said that the people that died were faking it. Oh wow! It, it it didn't it didn't take just a you know a, a couple hours until people were saying that. So, uh, wow. not not that I probably flat earthers are. I don't remember any specifics. I was a bit disgusted by it. So, so all right. Well, that was great, Will. Uh, I think I think you did a fantastic job there. Um, they had to run around a bit and they were uncomfortable uh which is which is a good thing to see um uh anything else uh anything you want to say uh, to wrap up as we as we kind of we're gonna uh head out here in a minute no just th thanks for everything you do on your channel i love your stuff and uh keep keep it going all right thanks will uh don't don't hang up when when i end the show here will so we can we can chat a little bit in zoom um i uh for those i i was gonna say at the beginning i will be going to texas for the eclipse it will be in naples texas so if you're interested in seeing the eclipse in texas and if you want for some dumb reason to be near me while seeing it that's where i'll be um 
I'm not doing any organization other than I'll, I'll probably, I'm going to have an area. I'll figure out where I'll be so we could all be in that same area, but find your own accommodations, um, bring your own telescope uh, or P1000 or whatever. Um, and if anybody's really super interested in surveying a football field in Mississippi and you have the capability of doing it, you contact me. Um, if you don't know how, mctune.net slash contact will give all my important contact information. All right, Will, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Here we go. MC Tune, drop that beat. All right, let it flow. Let yourself go. So I know that is the so, tempo. So, yeah, let's do this. So, let's do this. Um, Yo, it's MC Tune, the debunking tycoon. I shatter flat earthers, make a face of the moon. Your attempts are decent, but they'll swoon in the face of my logic like a deflated balloon. Oh, MC Tune, the monsoon cartoons. I'm the real saints and declares to their views. Your theories are like old brooms, sweeping ignorance or just spreading the views. FDFP stands for fumbling the facts, evidently. I drop truth bombs so splendidly. Your approach is soft, mine's unrelenting. I bring the science while well, you're just venting. Don't be tuned, they're flipping with a silver spoon. I have some pseudo science to make them change their tune. You're the sidekick, I'm the room. When it comes to debunking, I'm the room. Hold on a second. <laughs> the Zoom call died. Everything died. No.